Hello and welcome to Note Investing Made Easier. I am your host, Martin Signs, and with me, I have uh, the honor to uh, bring on our very special guest, Mr. Dave Van Horn of PPR Note Company. Um, Mr. Van Horn, welcome to the program. Yeah, I'm always interested about uh, learning how to do it easier because I think I've done everything the hard way. So I'm glad I'm on this episode. I'm hoping to learn something here. Uh, you know what? I'm in the same bucket because I'm bringing you on and, and people that are much smarter than me so I can make it easier for myself. I've only known the hard way. So <laughs> you're not Thank much you. help to me then. No. Well, I tell you what, um, you know, normally I, I like to start the, um, the webinar discussing <clears throat> the young investor the person that started, you know, way back when, because I'm always fascinated with how that person, what that person did, uh, you know, in terms of their goal setting, in terms of their rituals to bring them where they are today. But in your case, I'm going to actually start with where you're at presently. Okay. And, um, you know, you, you're someone that just, you know, released the book, um, you know, real estate note investing, which is a phenomenal read. Um, I, 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 I just, I learned so much from many different angles and we're going to touch on that as well as, um, you know, as well as coming out with the, um, the, in, in the mid Atlantic summit for real estate investors in Philadelphia on the 21st and 22nd of April in just a, a few weeks here. Um, yeah. so, so you're fun. Let's start with your, you know, PPR and what your company is about. So it is a company, as I, as I understood from the book, a $100 million uh, fund of, of institutional notes. I know you also own a uh, large portfolio of real estate property for yourself. How did PPR form? By accident. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, really, we were, uh, well, we were investors first. So we were, hey, um, but in reality, uh, it was a timing thing. So I used to run a real estate investor networking group that started out with 12 people and it actually grew to be in five states, six cities from Baltimore to New York. And we ended up with about 8,000 people in our database and it, we were all real estate investors. And I used to, you know, when I first started the group, it was me and a couple, like an insurance agent, a mortgage guy, me, I was a realtor. And we just kind of, you know, combined a couple people together, an accountant, an attorney, a couple of those people. And we just started with our own networks, built this group. And we, I used to interview speakers that would come to the group. And of course, someone came from New York and was raising capital for pools of delinquent second mortgages. And um, I didn't do anything probably for three years, but my partner did, my partner John did. And then um, right before the downturn, I was a Remax agent and I probably went from selling about 75 houses a year to about seven. And my partner, John was my, was one of my loan officers and he was in a similar boat where there was just no, you know, real estate's a finance driven business. And at the downturn, there was just nothing to do. Um, I was okay financially with my rental portfolio, but uh, from a business perspective in real estate, it was pretty dark times for, you know, real estate investors. There was no financing and um, me, you know, me and my, uh, I remember we met for lunch at like, I don't know if it was a hole of hands or something. And we were near the, I think we were near the Plymouth meeting mall and we were, went for lunch and literally mapped it out on a cocktail napkin. Like, and uh, it's funny, the roles we had kind of shifted, but my, uh, my partner was going to work assets and me and my other buddies were going to raise money. And we started out with our own money and we, you know, bought a couple assets and, you know, the deal we struck up with the person in New York was, hey, show us how to collect on distressed debt and we'll buy assets from you. And up until that point, I mean, second mortgages were not a big uh, product line or product mix in the marketplace. I mean, second mortgages hadn't been out all that long um, and there hadn't been a downturn where there was a lot of distress, uh, period, let alone first or seconds or second or first or second mortgages and especially seconds. Up until that time, I don't think there was any uh, previous downturn of junior liens in the marketplace. So there was really no market for it. There was, it was a weird, odd duck at the time. 
And does does um <clears throat> does the fact that you know when when PPR came out and and you raised capital and you bought these junior liens and you began becoming an expert in the workout um, phase and getting loan modifications, et cetera. Now you, you went from that to starting to sell, uh, you know, operating as a trade desk with PPR. Um, in the very beginning, we were just like anybody else. Like we literally started with four loans and we had a grand slam, a home run and two went awry. And uh, if I had only bought two, we probably wouldn't be talking right now. Um, or the wrong two, right? And the, you know, once we got the model working, then we were like, okay, this is great. And then we started, uh, you know, using more capital. And then we started raising some private money. But then what was happening was we would buy these delinquent mortgages, get them reperforming. And then it was like watching paint dry. It was just, okay, now payments are coming in. Now what? And we didn't have a way to recapitalize. And there really wasn't much of a marketplace uh, for reperforming second mortgages. And even in the very beginning, they were equity second mortgages. We didn't buy anything without equity in it initially. Um, so was that a saving grace that there was no there, there was no market for buying the reperformers at the time? Um, in a, no, the saving grace was my partner Bob had Donna Bauer's uh, course <laughs> on his desk, and I picked it up one day, and, and I was flipping through it, and I saw this thing on collateral assignments. And um, I actually took that to uh, my attorney, Craig Cipetti, and I was like, hey, can you clean these up and can we actually do this? And we literally did hundreds of collateral assignments of notes and mortgage because we had no note buyers. We, we didn't have, there was, you know, today we have probably 7,000 note buyers. Uh, back then we had zero. Um, and there was really no marketplace for this product. And we didn't have a quantity of product. It, was, it wasn't like I could go to a trade desk and say, here, can I sell these for reperforming second liens, right? So it was kind of like um, we did have investors because I was good at raising capital from commercial real estate times, you know, when I was raising money for other real estate projects. So raising money for notes was a little bit more challenging because it's like an intangible. But the... Um, Initially, it was a little tougher, but people, because the real estate investors did get their mind around it because, hey, it's a mortgage, there's a property behind it. And then what we started doing was uh, these collateral assignments where we were borrowing against the note. So if you were an investor, you would lend us, you know, certain percentage of money. Usually, I think we capped it at 80, 85 percent of, of the note value. So we would get our capital back because, remember, we bought it non-performing. We made it performing. So we were getting the, the rehab to price, right? So we were getting all our capital back then some, and it was tax-free because it was a loan. And then we were securing you with the, by recording the collateral assignment and note mortgage. So there's a promissory note, and it's two documents, really. It's simple. And um, we were doing so many of them that we actually had to start using a private placement because we were, do because we were like pulling money to pull money to go buy pools. So they're like, oh, 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 you're a security because you're doing so many. Um, so, uh, but we built the whole company that way, um, you know, really off this debt investment, that, you know, backed by our reperforming mortgages initially. And then that gave us time to, what we started doing was teaching. So we started teaching a little bit about, you know, buying reperforming notes. And um, I'll never forget, we used to have like, it was a monumental amount of work in the beginning. We would take like all weekend or a whole Saturday and it'd be like all three of us and there'd be like 20, 30 people in our office and we would hope to get like one or two note buyers out of that. Cause yeah. <laughs> you know, picture trying to sell, you know, reperforming once delinquent upside down second mortgages that were in bankruptcy. Like there's just not a big audience for that. Right. Um, but the, one of the first uh, classes we taught, I'll never forget it. Some guy raised his hand. He's like, well, what do you do if it read thoughts? And we're like, oh, crap, what do we do? You know, and, um, and that kind of muffled the room. And then we were like, oh, we better come up with something. And that's when we, you know, created our, our warranty that we, you know, you see we have today. And the warranty enabled us to sell a lot more product. You know, we got a little bit of a premium for the warranty. But I think investors felt more comfortable. And then they, you know, and next thing you know, we started to build this marketplace and today there's probably, you know, there's a good number of note buyers out there, right, today. So it's a, it's kind of a, I don't know that we started all of it, but we definitely uh, made a dent in some of that. You know. 
Absolutely. And, and, you know, just giving that assurance, um, you know, even, even at a premium is a good benefit for those that <clears throat> are not active full-time note investors. Like for myself, I buy re-performers and, um, and I would prefer not having the warranty in place. I, you know, I'd prefer for, getting yeah. a better yield. Well, and, yeah, sure. And if you're more familiar with the MPLs, um, then yeah, that's the way to go. But it, it just enabled us to, um, well, one is, you're right, we, we, sell, you know, we sell notes very quickly, uh, pretty much you know, in minutes. Like you can't really sell real estate that quickly. So it, we are fortunate that way. So it worked out well for us. And, uh, you know, but, and, and there's sure, there's many ways to approach the business. So, but no, it worked well for us. And that's what got us off the ground. And then once we had students, at one point we were coaching, uh, even on the MPL side, and we would actually give you a practice note when you took a course with us. And it gave you a chance to, you know, feel the note, touch the note, call in, ask questions about it. So it was just a different way to learn. It was like a learn by doing thing. And uh, we, gosh, I bet we did that for over five years, you know, a good long time. And it had hundreds of students over the years. But over time, it, you know, became more, you know, a lot more compliance. It became more time consuming. And then we grew as a fund, you know. And, you know, our vision today is to become a billion dollar fund. So it's hard to, you know, not that we don't like to teach, we do, we just do it in different ways, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. And so let me ask you with, um, you know, with the, with the hundreds into the thousands of students that you've taught over the course of time, um, <clears throat> how does it feel when, when you have like, um, you know, all the, all the folks that you taught that are still on the scene? You know, I had Deep Dawn here the other day, and, you know, she gave props to you. Uh, you know, I know Bill McCafferty, Fred Moskowitz. McCafferty. I could just kind of run down the list, and, and you'll know many of the names. How does it feel to know that, you know, you've helped build a, you know, a career for themselves? I mean, it is rewarding. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Well, anybody we can help. Um, you know, even the book, like this book that I recently wrote, it's really not designed for – necessarily the MPL, you know, note buyer per se, it was really geared more towards real estate investors by intention, you know, and um, it's because they don't, they don't always, uh, you know, recognize the note business, or they don't see the value in learning some of those note techniques, which I think are valuable in many aspects of our life. And I'm sure you saw that through some of the some of it's autobiographical a little bit about my story, but I used the story to tell the illustrations along the way of lessons learned in the note space overall generally, you know? So, you know, to me, the note world is very big, you know, whereas some people look at it as, well, you're in this niche delinquent second mortgage space or something. Believe it or not, today we're primarily in senior liens, but people still think of us as the second lien shop sometimes. And, um, that's okay. We don't really, <laughs> we're still buying a lot of product. You can't, the problem with if you become a billion dollar fund, you're not going to be just in the second lien space for sure. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, so let's just take a step back because, because um, half, at least half of the people that are watching this webinar are, are going to be newbies and some with some money and some without money. So let's take a step back to what your book, what your book espouses here and that is you started out, you swung the hammer for 13 years with the rehabbing, um, you know, in construction, and then you started hitting the RIAs. So, so just walk us through, you know, how someone at an earlier stage can just get their feet wet and get momentum in the real estate slash note space. <laughs> <laughs> well, everybody's different, right? Um... I was actually in construction 22 years. I was 13 years working for someone else and then actually had my own company for 10 years. And my, and my oldest son does that today. But the, I think the big thing for me, which I probably, there's a lot of things I didn't seem to figure out till I was like in my forties, unfortunately. I don't know what the magic years or decade there was, but it was almost like my philosophy started to change. My outlook started to change. Um, I had gotten hurt. I got out of the one business, started another. So there was so much change in my early forties, but it was like, looking back, I would, I could see all the things that, um, I wasn't aware of or didn't pay attention to. And I could tell you exactly where these regrets were. 
and there were a few of them. And, and one of them was I was, uh, I didn't network very well previous to that. I mean, I had a decent, you know, roll of decks of contractors and things, but I didn't, um, and I networked as a realtor, but I didn't really network as a real estate investor or as a note investor very well prior to that time period. I was kind of a loner, more of a like a know-it-all, you know, I know what I'm doing, leave me alone type thing. And the only reason I went looking for help was really I needed financing. And that's really what it came down to. And I didn't realize how much, uh, I was just saying this to somebody the other day, and I've often said it to my kids, you know, financing is this weird thing that you go through life, you either master it and use it as a tool, or you sit there and it happens to you and you, real, you realize, it's like you don't realize what's going on around you. It's like all these things are happening to most people every day and they don't realize the impact financing is having on their life, whether it's through their insurance or their mortgage or their auto loan or their, you know, all these financing things are happening to us, yet most people don't understand it very well. They don't understand, you know, how to pay down debt in a third of the time. They don't know how to leverage. They don't know arbitrage very well. There's all these financing concepts that the average person just doesn't pay attention to. And I call it like finance happens to them. And they tend to sit there and like blame everything, you know, well, and, and I was similar to that way. And then I realized, no, I can take control of this financing. And once you master the financing component of things, your world will dramatically change and you can really use finance as a tool to accelerate your wealth building and things like that. Oh, uh, that, and, and, um, you know, I just would say reading your book, uh, it's uh, there's a whole underlining theme of financing and note investing all throughout. Um, you know, just just touching on Jimmy Napier and you know how you ran into him and I he would have been someone that I would have loved to have met. Um, you know, Robert Allen, multiple streams of income. You know, just what you're saying now with controlling your finances is, is all his message. And so these people that that <clears throat> you learned from the real estate agent that bought investment properties that he started mentoring you, you know, that, yeah, that kind yeah. of touched on, you know, all, all kind of built, built you up along the way. So what, um, what would you say is, um, is the most critical thing? I understand like you talk a lot about you would have worked with speed more if you know yeah. you would have accelerated yourself more so, yeah i was i never circled back to that right so really what it is is what are you good at what do you like to do what it's almost like the triad of awesome right what am i good at what do i make money at what do i like to do and figuring that out and then kind of hiring everybody else to do all the other stuff but it's also like how do you accelerate things and how do you really exponentially leverage things and even today, I have a coach. Um, I'm in a group out of Manhattan called Birthing of Giants, and my coach is pounding me. He's, you know, what's what can you really leverage this year that's really going to take you to another level? Is it people, money, time, technology? What is it? What is this leverage that's really going to catapult you or catapult you in your business or your personal life? What's really going to set you set you off? Like really take you off? And I think a lot of us don't really look. Uh, to leveraging our resources enough. And one of my, you know, looking back on my regrets was, you know, I, I, I might have, I don't know if I told the story or not, it was when I was a Remax agent, you know, I was selling like 75 houses a year to real estate investors. And I had all the dots connected. I had the contractors, I had the title, I had this. And I'm sitting here making commissions, not looking, looking back going, I could have bought them all. I could have been buying 75 houses a year. You know, I have a good buddy in Memphis who's actually coming to the Mid-Atlantic Summit. He owns 1,500 houses. I'm like, how did he get there? And looking at him, I'm like, I could have done that. I could have been buying 75 houses a year. What was wrong with me? You know, I've been a realtor 30 years now, right? So I could, I could own 1,500 houses too, but I was thinking small. I wasn't thinking big. I'm like skipping over, you know, penny, skipping over dollars to pick up pennies, you know, I'm I'm looking at commissions instead of looking at the whole deal at the time. And looking back, you know, if I had done that, I might not be in the no business, but, um, you know, I think there's ways we can exponentially build our wealth and catapult things. And we, we don't, you know, what was holding me back sometimes it was finance. I, I was like, well, I don't like hard money rates. So I didn't use hard money. 
And then I found out later from my good friend who had done his first 39 deals. He owns, you know, a couple hundred houses. And he's like, yeah, my first 39 deals were with a hard money lender. I'm like, why would you do that? And then he told me he was making money on the draw. I never knew. I never heard of that. I go, what do you mean you're making money on the draw? Well, if the next phase was 10 grand. I got it done for six grand. I put four grand in my pocket and the takeout financing took it, took the whole 10 out. I'm like, that's brilliant. I would have done a million of those deals. But I was, I was so focused on high interest rate, I wasn't looking at the whole picture. I didn't understand the financing at the time. I didn't understand making money on the draw. I just discounted it and said, oh, hard money has a high rate in points. I won't use it. Yet, I could have been making 30, 50 grand a deal. No, I'm making a two grand commission, right? Mm. How dumb was I, right? So, you know, you look back and you go, um, you could have really maximized some of these avenues along the way that you didn't. Not that it's horrible. I mean, I ended up okay. <laughs> I'm not saying that, but you know what I mean? It, it's just, a, I wish I had understood things better. And one of the things I was trying to accomplish in the book is this overall view of just notes in general, because I don't know that anybody gives us that 30,000 foot view of what's really going on with financing in the world. And, you know, I started out in college taking that course in money and banking. Really, I was just following this cool hippie teacher who gave me a B in everything I took. I was like, all right, I'm going to take this guy's course. And uh, it turned out that, you know, you know, here I am using money and bank. I'm trying to be the bank today, right? I'm trying to uh, basically be disruptive to banks. I mean, if you think about what PPR is today, we're, you know, we're trying to become where you can invest 24 hours a day in a Wall Street asset on your cell phone with no middlemen, no fees. I mean, that's about as disruptive to banking and financial services as you could get, right? No advisor fees. So it's, you know, it's great, right? Like, you know, is crowdfunding the next step? Is this or that the next step? You know what I mean? So you can really take uh, no business to a whole nother level. And, you know, we have some great strategies coming ahead, you know, looking forward to. Well, so, so with your, um, you know, you key in on the book with, with the emphasis on education, emphasis on coaching, emphasis on raising capital, all these things that are important for someone new and experienced in the game. How, how are you parlaying that into the Mid-Atlantic Summit that you're gonna be hosting in a few weeks? <laughs> I'm gonna do all that and then some. <laughs> now, <laughs> well actually, the, you know, it's funny, I'm gonna be, I was gonna tell this story at the beginning of the Mid-Atlantic is, um, it really came from a couple ideas. One was this, open source concept of real estate investor information. And I kind of get that from bigger pockets. I like that concept. So part of it's that, and part of it is, you know, pressing the flesh, actually meeting people, connecting with people. And I feel like a lot of the events, um, you know, I've attended a million events over the years and some of them, maybe it's me, but some of it's getting tired or it's the same old thing. And I'm like, no, I want to make this different. I want to, um, I like this concept. Uh, so there's three main things. One is open source real estate information. I like that idea, but I want good information. I want good people. I want the audience to be just as uh, influential, powerful, knowledgeable as the speakers. Uh, that's one piece. The second piece is I think I run a group called Strategic Investor Alliance, which is a high net worth, invite only group. Um, and the premise of that group is to share, build, and preserve wealth. And what we do is we share resources and we share, it's kind of become like a mini mutual fund of alternative investments. And notes is just one piece, right? We, I want to be diversified too. I can't invest my retirement in PPR. So I'm always looking for other vehicles as well, right? So I created this group. We share advisors. We share alternative investments. And I like some of the advisors and some of the uh, participants. So I'm incorporating some of that into the Mid-Atlantic Summit. So I'm bringing in my high net worth group people, advisors. A lot of our speakers are coming from the high net worth group down to the Mid-Atlantic Summit. Not that it's down, but to a group of, um, hey, I was unaccredited, right? I want to show people the way to become wealthy, to become to utilize these three components, like you said, education, networking, and a mentor or, you know, JV partner or somebody to shadow with, whatever that is that catapults you. So it's, so that's two of them, right? Open source. And then the SIA, uh, strategic, uh, investor alliance concepts. And then the third piece is impact. 
So I'm trying to have an impact that weekend. So I am not taking a dime. I'm literally donating the entire event. I'm donating every book sale. I'm donating every, anything I can. And in this, this year's charities project home, which is uh, mm-hmm. for the homeless in Philly and uh, Detroit. And I think what's kind of neat about this event that's different is it's funny how all the guard goes down. Like the vendor, that's a tough sell. Try to sell to a vendor that you have to tell them they can't sell. There's no pitching. There's no yeah. selling. And oh, by the way, you want a table? And um, at first I was <laughs> like, no one's going to do this. And yet we've sold out all the vendor spots. And, Steve uh, Lloyd's going to do it. Yeah, 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 right. Because he, well, he gets what I'm doing. So uh, some people appreciate. So really, it's three things. How do I have an impact? Um, and I think it's just going to be a fun event because there's no, you know, there's no, uh, everybody's guards down, right? We're all there to have fun. We're all there to have a great time in Philly. And uh, I think it's going to be a great week. So, no, absolutely. I, I look forward to coming. And uh, and uh, Deepta has offered, her opened up her home to me and oh, my wow. children. And my children, so I don't know if I wish that on her, but uh, but she has done so. Uh, thank you, Deepa. Um, but anyway, um, so so when you're going to, and you even touch on this in your book, and and many of us that are listening now have gone to the Rias, right? Every Wednesday night, you hear the speaker. Um, you know, they may be good, they may be bad. They're offering a a Saturday option, you know, for the potential upsell and so on. So it's just a crapshoot. Right. So do you feel in some respect that you have just taken the best of the best in terms of in terms of talent, in terms of resources and, and just kind of combine that for the purposes of the summit? Well, I mean, most of a, um, I don't think we have much of a guru component to what we're doing or anything like that. The majority of, you know, I'm trying to think of most of the people on the on the agenda are really more doers. You know what I mean? Um, you know, I, I was mentioning my buddy that owns 1500 houses or whatever. He doesn't need to sell anything. Like, you know, he's not, you know, you know, Steve from Stone Bay, he, he doesn't need to sell anything, you know? Um, and I think these people are phenomenal. You know, even Joe, you know, Joe Fairless has done probably, he's probably approaching 300 million in multifamily. I mean, this guy's in his thirties. You know, I mean, these wow. are some, some fabulous people that are really knocking it out of the park uh, with whatever their expertise is. And we're trying to cut, co- we're literally trying to cover as many topics as we can. Um, I'm actually going through that right now. A lot of the breakout sessions that we're trying to line up, I'm, I'm literally trying to line up so many, my head is spinning, but it's um, no, but I just think it's just so much value in one place. And I think it saves people time. And I think it, um, and, and people can trust the information because there's no agenda. There's, there's nobody. It's really a provide value for, I mean, Hey, we all sell stuff. We all have businesses or, or day jobs or whatever you want to call it. I don't mean it that way, but I think this is a, a different type of event where it's, it's a sharing first uh, mentality or value first mentality. Um, and I, I think it's a great, you know, I'm mimicking that off the West coast. I, I was introduced to that concept in the Bay area with Jay Martin and I'm just bringing the concept East really. Oh, that's terrific. Yeah. I didn't invent anything, right? I'm, <laughs> I'm just a schmuck that borrows all these ideas from other people. Right. Well, you, you, you took, you took good ideas and, and you're acting on it. So, um, so you mentioned the football game of life. Can you just tell us what that means? <laughs> um, you know, that, that kind of comes from, you know, I did financial planning and sold insurance for a little bit. And it was, you know, mainly to my same audience of clients, you know, in the real estate side. And, you know, they would use that concept sometimes where this, you know, you have this football game of life between the time you're 25 to about 65. That's your working years for most people. And when you get out of college, you're all gun ho and you're like, I got my whole life ahead of me. And then by 45, you're like, holy crap, what happened? I, you know, I got divorced or whatever, you know, whatever happened, my business failed. And then by the time you're 55, you're like, oh boy, I really have any time left. I got to save up money for retirement. And you see all these different phases. And I think with the football game of life, you see, you know, just from uh, being a realtor and a financial planner and insurance agent, you see where people, you see all the life events, you see all the distress in the, in the housing market and things like that. You see where people get married, they get divorced, they, 
you know, you deal with estates, you deal with nursing homes, you're dealing with every component of life. And what I noticed was um, some of the biggest uh, mistakes I see people, especially starting out, people with, who don't have a lot of money, is a lot of the mistakes are made in housing and they're made in that first 10 years between 25 and 35. And I think a lot of it is, it's like the herd effect. They just do what everybody else does. And one of the things that helped me in my success, because I was just a blue collar guy, and you know, how did I become you know, a multi, multi-millionaire? And you know, I look at my siblings, I look at my in-laws, and they're kind of, you know, they're not, right? So it's like, how did that, what was different? What did they do differently? And a lot of it had to do with things like housing, and, and some of them made more money than me. And yet, um, catapulted past a lot of those folks financially, anyway. Um, and not that they're not happy or anything, I don't mean it that way. But I think a lot of it is errors in judgment, um, you, know, it's, you know, living beyond our means sometimes, you know, we rent more house than we really needed or, we, you know, we, the first house, we didn't invest intentionally, like in our, in our primary residences, just that one bucket alone could dramatically change your, your world. Because most people will buy a house, sell it, buy a house, sell it, buy a house, sell it. By the time they're 55 or 45 to 55, if they're doing well, the accountant is telling you, go get a beach house, go get a duplex. And you go to do that, and your financing terms are different. Well, didn't you already own three of those houses? Didn't you already pay those closing costs? Didn't you already have owner owner occupied financing with better terms and rates? And the answer is yes. Plus, you already lived there five years, maybe in each house. Well, that's five years towards a thirty year mortgage, and now the tenant's buying you the rest of that house, and you're writing off all of that. And I I, I use this example for people, Martin. Like if me and you were the same guy. And you just went to work and we made the same money. You went to work and you just lived in your house that you lived in. And I'm Dave, the real estate investor, and we had the same job and I invest my money in real estate property. What happens over about a 30 year period there is I build this portfolio of property, but really the fundamental difference is all your tax dollars went to Uncle Sam, all my tax dollars went to the portfolio. So at the end of our you know, working years, I have a portfolio of property that's probably paid off or close to paid off that Uncle Sam bought me through deductions. You're kind of like, well, I have my house paid off and now you're equity rich and cash poor and I'm doing okay because I'm cash flowing from my properties or that are paid off or whatever. Now I'm using that as a simple example, but that's kind of what happens. You're able to build that portfolio through the, a lot of it's through the tax savings. So for me, that was, that's what happened for me. So I'm not saying you should do that or I'm not, I'm not that, I'm not a preacher. I'm just saying, you know, what happened that was different for me. One of them was, one area was saving money in taxes because every dollar you save in taxes is another dollar to invest. So if you invest intentionally, I call it like with a little bit of purposeful planning, most people go into their primary residence. They're not planning it as an investment. They're not planning their exit. Like when you buy an investment, you should know your exit, right? Most people go into a primary residence, they're like, yeah, I just need a place to live and I want to you know, impress my friends or whatever that is. They're not looking at, hey, maybe that first townhouse or condo, maybe the payment should be less than rent so I can keep it. Like nobody's thinking like that normally. And I think that needs to shift. And I think, you know, some people go, well, it's too late for me. Well, it's not too late for your kids or your grandkids or, you know, you could think differently about how you invest in your primary. And that's just one bucket of many that could be a wealth building technique for you along with saving taxes. And then the other one was utilizing your equity. I mean, um, you know, I ended up getting a couple million dollars in equity uh, or using the bank's money. I started buying houses with credit cards, right? Mm -hmm. So I was using OPM. That's really the theory. It's not so much that I was using credit cards. I was using other people's money to build my wealth, to buy my properties, to renovate them, that kind of thing. And then eventually I got equity in my portfolio. I started tapping the equity and lending that out or tapping the equity to do another deal. And I think that that exponential leverage like that, when you're in accumulation mode, makes a lot of sense. And then the other concept is how do you pay your debt? You, you can pay down to any debt almost in a third of the time through sweep accounts. So I think people miss the boat on that. We're, we're real, you, sweep account is a concept you can learn by the eighth grade. I mean, it's four, you know, fourth to eighth grade, you could teach a sweep account to someone. But that's not taught, right? So it's like, what's wrong with that? So now, most of most Americans especially are straddled with all kinds of debt, right? They're in fact, probably most people are 60 days away from bankruptcy in, in a lot of cases if they were to lose their jobs, right? So 
I think it's a lot of this, it's back to nobody understands finance, right? They don't, they don't realize the repercussions of debt, how to get rid of it, how to accelerate it, good debt versus bad debt. All these concepts are just not taught. I didn't learn. It's funny. I was a business major, yet learned them well after college was over, right? Which is ironic, right? Like, how can that be? How can you be an philosophy. accounting major and not learn any of that, right? Like, I was a philosophy major. I certainly didn't learn any of it. <laughs> So, so um, here, here's the thing, right? So you, you go now that, now that um, you know, people have access to social media and, and they're looking, they're yearning. They know they need to know something about finances. They know they need to make an adjustment. Um, you know, my Facebook group just gets dozens of people every day requesting to join because they want to know something. They feel they're missing something. So let's talk about, you talked about fo football game of life. You know, maybe the person 25, 35 can start accumulation mode. But let's talk about the person that comes to your door or our door, if you will, you know, at age 60 and they need some type of expedited, um, you know, solution for themselves. What do you tell that person? Well, yeah, I mean, to make higher yields, you have to take on a little more work or more risk usually, right? So it's, you know, obviously if you're doing flips, you can make, bigger chunks of money, right? Or if you're uh, buying NPLs and you're rehabbing those, you're going to make bigger hits. Now you're taking on a little more risk or a little more work, right? So it's one or the other. If you're lazy like me, you don't want the work, right? So I'm more of a passive guy at my age, but I did a lot of work earlier. You know, I did a lot of the hard work and fix and flips and rehabs at an earlier age. And now I'm you know, I look at multiple buckets. Really, it, it, it's what my one buddy always says. He goes, there really should only be one goal in life. It should be to get as much passive income as quickly as you can by retirement at the latest and as much tax-free as possible. Now, he didn't say what your job should be. He didn't say what your passion should be. He just said, that should be your goal. Now, he's older than me and wiser, but he's kind of right. Like, that's not driven home in third grade, right? That That's not... You know, that's really your number one focus is because once you get this passive income, you can kind of control your life, your destiny, your traveling, whatever. So I think that's and then you can live the life you really want because that's really what we all want to be happy. Right. We want to be able to live the life we want. And the only way you're going to get there is passive income. It's not earned income. We're kind of sold the earned income path. I don't know if it's an industrial revolution idea, but. You know, it's just that, you know, that's what we were taught, right? Go to school, work real hard, and everything will be okay. And it is for some people, especially software engineers, right? <laughs> but, you know, but not everybody's a software engineer, right? So it's, uh, to your point, how do you make up for lost time? It's a little more challenging, right? You got to get, uh, you know, you're not going to get there on traditional investments. You know, I look at that model, you know, the traditional 401k, I mean, it's, a, it's more of a hope and pray strategy. And I don't really like those. I like, I don't want uh, a net worth in a bank account. Oh, you're worth X. Well, no, I want cash flow that I know I can live off that replaced my income from my day job or whatever that was. So it's really about how do you replace your income, I think is the most important thing instead of, oh, how do we build your net worth? I mean, both are important, but I rather have cash flow than net worth in a lot of cases. Now, I'm not saying always, but you get the idea. Um, and I think people tend to focus on the wrong thing. And I, I think, you know, you, you want all of those, you know? Yeah. Well, it, it's interesting even, um, and I'm going to reference Robert Allen because, you, you know, you, you, you hit on that well in the book. You know, what, what does he say in uh, multiple streams of income? He's like, don't just fill the bucket or the bathtub, I think he said, with, with water and create additional bathtubs with water, but plug the holes. Right. Right, right. So yeah. you have to look at where the, the outflow is going and you well, have to reduce. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're right. Like it's, it, I mean, sure, you can get, I think I see people do both. They, sometimes they over-focus on plugging holes too, right? It's always, I mean, I was always from a school of thought, I'd rather generate more revenue than save. Like if I have a choice between make more money or save money, I'm more of a make more money guy. Um, but you can kind of do a little bit of both along the way. And I think, uh, you know, I don't think you want to be over obsessed with saving money and being paranoid and risk averse with everything. I think you got to take some chances to make, you know, knock it out of the park a little bit. And I think you do need to be diversified. 
I know personally I have multiple buckets. And I think a lot of people make that mistake, especially I, I hear them. I hear them talking to me. They're like, well, you're the note guy. You must hate real estate. I'm like, you guys are nuts. <laughs> Plenty of real estate. I, I own plenty of stocks and bonds. I own plenty of all kinds of things. I don't focus on just one thing. I have a well diverse, I have multiple businesses. I, you know, I do many, many things. And I, I think people think that, uh, well, you know, you're the real estate guy and you don't like notes or you're the note guy. You don't like, there's nothing further from the truth. There's, there's more than one way to do it. And there's no right or wrong answer. I've never said, you know, Martin's business doesn't make sense. No, it makes great sense to Martin because that's what he's good at and that's what he knows. Uh, so do what you know, do what you're good at. And, I, you know, I don't care if you were a brain surgeon, Martin, you want to convert that money into passive streams of income because you're not going to be able to perform surgery all the time because that business is going to revolve around you. Yeah. Right? yeah. You can't replace yourself very easily. So, you know, some of us can replace ourselves easier than others, but at the same time, we're still trying to replace uh, earned income with passive income. And the sooner that we figure that out and do it, the better off we are. I mean, I even have an insurance bucket. I have a qualified plan bucket. I have um, multiple buckets of assets. I look at everything as assets, different types of assets. Um, you know, people, uh, yeah, I, I forget. I was reading a comment from somebody who's like, well, real estate has more tax advantages than notes. Yeah, no kidding. I'm not telling you to do one or the other. I'm telling you to do both, right? Right. Uh, I'm not saying I don't have write-offs. I have plenty of write-offs. You know, I'm 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 managing the whole enchilada, right? You know, so I think uh, people lose sight of that. Well, well, um, so so just kind of just just to uh, clarify or just kind of ask you a question on based on what you're saying. Um, if you the the successful Dave right now that that I'm talking to. Um, you are working with a you, you are working with a group out of Manhattan that's going to help you elevate your fund from a hundred million dollars to a billion dollar fund, and you're going to do that by understanding your resources, leveraging all your resources to the to the maximum, and and then kind of working from that. Would you give that same advice to someone starting out, whether they're 25 or 65? Oh, absolutely. I, I you know my son is in film. And he moved to LA Well, he's in New York now. But when he first moved to LA, I'm like, you need to network with people. You need to get educated in the space. You need to find a mentor or, or, or so, you know, somebody like that or a coach or, and, and it never changes. The only thing that changes is your level of coaching, right? So when my company was smaller, like I'm on probably my third major business coach, but they were different levels. Like one, you had to do a certain level of income to have that coach. And then when I got to a different level of revenue, I could have another higher level coach. And today I'm in a, a different level of, of where I'm at. And I can tell by the peers in the group, I feel this big, you know, I'm like, I'm a little guy in that group because these people are really knocking it out of the park. Well, I want to be the dumbest guy in the room, right? Yeah. That's a Steve Lloyd line. <laughs> I would be the dumbest guy in the room. And, you know, that's when you know you're in the right room. When you're the smartest guy in the room, you're in the wrong room. You need to change rooms. You need to up your game, right? Yeah. So, so let's just kind of bring it to the note space for a minute. What um, the, a, a lot of people that I engage with and that come into the note space, they've been rehabbing homes and, and, you know, they're kind of just kind of worn down from the day to day grind. You, you um, mentioned, or they're just the roller coaster ride of you know they're flipping, they're they're acquiring, flipping, and then they're on to their next deal, and, and they're repeating that process. You mentioned in the book just contemplating life as you're standing in line at the Home Depot. When you, you were already in accumulation mode. You know, you 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 sounded like you were in a flow. You had a nice value chain. You had the title company. You were the agent. You were getting commissions on the deals. You also had the rehabbing. So you had the value chain down. And meanwhile, you're there online at Home Depot. So would that, would, would, the, would the successful Dave Van Horn be the same guy? Do you still go to the Home Depot line and have those thoughts? It's extremely rare. <laughs> um, it's funny you say that because a lot of guys can't put the tools down. And one of the things I did was I got rid of my tools. <laughs> so think, think about that. That's a, that's a really hard thing to do. So my, you know, in my past, I was a painting contractor. There was nothing harder than to get rid of my tools, right? 
Um, I've always had, I even struggle now. I have, you know, a Lexus that resembles a pickup truck more than any other Lexus. You know, like I can't get away from that. Like, in fact, they, they kind of made me get rid of my truck here at work. They're like, you can't pick up clients from the airport in that truck. Um, but that was the kind of guy I was. I always had trucks. I always had, you know, tools. Today, I don't have any tools. I have to like call my oldest son and say, can you get over here and help your father out? You know, I don't have any tools. And, um, you know, it's, it's the thing that made me stop doing it. And it was the same way with being a realtor today. I don't practice real estate. I have, I, I give it all away. I give all my real estate business away. Um, and the, even the girl that I give the business to, she's like, Hey, uh, you, you know, why don't you want to do this? And I'm like, I just don't have time. It's not the best use of my time. Um, your mom helped train me. I want to help you. And, and that's what I do. I, I give it to this, uh, my old boss's daughter does most of my real estate stuff just to help her out. I, and, you know, I, you know, I keep my license. I, I like my MLS access, but uh, I really an agent more for tax write-offs today than anything else. You know? But it's just, uh, so it is hard to give up things that were your expertise. It's hard. That's the hardest person to hire. So if you were a plumber, the hardest thing for you is to hire a plumber because nobody does it as good as you, right, Martin? But what I've found over the years is if someone can do it 80% as good as you, sometimes that's good enough. And, um, you know, what is the best use of your time and where do you, where do you bring the most value to the marketplace? And maybe it's not standing in line at Home Depot and maybe it's not being a painting contractor or a property manager. I used to be a property manager, right? Mm -hmm. Um, not a super high paying job right now i tweaked it and i actually made pretty good money at that but it's you know it's not the you know there's better use of my time especially today right yeah yeah no and and, and that kind of goes into line i'm just kind of reading some comments you know you also mentioned in the book um you know philosophy of yourself uh, for yourself is knowing yourself is it could, could you elaborate on that yeah, I mean, yeah, a lot of times we don't um, really know ourselves or we don't know what we're good at, especially, um, you know, I was a blue collar guy. And if you, you know, there's a book, Business Brilliant by uh, my one coach, Lewis Schiff. And that in that book, if you were to ask a blue, you know, they poll blue collar folks. And if you asked them what they were good at, they would list five or 10 things. But if you were to ask, you know, I don't know, Richard Branson, what are you good at? He's going to tell you one thing, maybe two. And, 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 he, and he actually polls people who make over 30 million a year. Well, those people, only, they're only good at one thing. Steve Lloyd's good at one thing, right? Raising so, capital. <laughs> you, you, same way as me. I, I mean, ask anybody. I'm, I'm really, you know, if you think I'm going to speak French and play golf well and do all the, I'm not your guy. But you need somebody to raise a crap load of capital, I'm your guy. You know, like it's what am I really good at? And it, it just takes time for us to focus on that. So anytime I'm doing anything but what I'm really good at, I'm wasting my time most of the time, right? Go do what you're best at. And that's really knowing yourself. The other thing is knowing, you know, some of us are afraid of, afraid of failure. Sometimes we're afraid of success. Some people are, I know I was afraid of success sometimes. And so, and so for the person that comes into the node space and they say, um, you know, it's easy to come in with high expectations and then feel overwhelmed because of the complexity of the industry. So that's where um, I, your fund is probably very popular with people. They can come in and they can invest passively, but still feel like they're in the note game to some, some extent. Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, I, whenever I'm meeting anyone, I, I never like try to talk somebody into anything. Like I never try to talk you into, Oh, you should do this or you should do that because everybody's so different. It's really when I'm, when I meet you, like if I met you for the first time, I'd be like, all right, what are you, what type of investor are you? Are you active or passive? What kind of time commitments do you have? What are your goals? What are you really trying to do? What is your risk level or tolerance? You know, what, you know, turns you on? What do you know about? What do you have knowledge about? You know, um, what are you familiar with? You know, and, and start there. And then, then it's more of a, more of like suggestions or what other people have done more so than, Oh, you should do this or you should do that. Or you should do what I did. I don't really believe in that because there's plenty of people that made a lot of money that did nothing familiar with what I do. Right. So it's a, so that's one way to look at it, but you're right. I mean, 
the, the thing with the note business, it's just like real estate. There's so many ways to make money. I mean, real estate, you could be selling cemetery lots or you could be selling a REIT, right? So it's like where that spectrum is just so big, right? Well, notes are like that too. Um, I have friends that make plenty of money in commercial notes and unsecured notes and secured notes and, you know, auto debt. I mean, there, there's just a million ways to make money in the note space. It's really pick one that you like or familiar with and utilize it. I mean, look at my buddy that, you know, the HVAC contractor, he finances heaters. Look at the dentist in Dallas who's financing dental work. It, think about it. They're in the note space, mm -hmm. but they're in a space that's a direct vertical like Robert Allen, multiple streams of income, where it's a channel they understand. It's something they do currently. They were out, they were giving that business away probably. And, and they bought the heating units at a discount. My best friend's in HVAC business. So he does that. He finances the units and he buys them at wholesale. Right. So there's nothing that says your IRA company can't start a finance company that finances heaters when your day business is the HVAC. You know, like you can get creative here. And I think we're just not, you know, the average person just doesn't think like that. They don't think of, you know, what other verticals in my world can I bring in and, and get paid multiple times uh, for the sake? Because think about it. We're, a lot of times we're doing the marketing to bring in the client. Well, why aren't we getting paid five times? Why are we only getting paid once? And it's because we're just not thinking about it. You know, we're, we're not looking at that. But I think it's, it, it's a lot of those types of things. Um, and it's how we pay for things, too. Uh, I think, you know, there's a lot of creative ways that we can, you know, I hate to say I don't really pay for much. <laughs> mm -hmm. hey. my investments pay for everything so it's kind of like uh yeah, you, trying you to be touched cheap. on that in the book well you know student loan debt for your son you know you have a note created that will pay you know same thing you set up with your mother and for passive income so yeah yeah you yeah touched i mean there's, well there's, yeah there's a lot of different things we can do now some people might go well i just make more money it's not worth my time well that's great but not everybody's in that position right i mean sure if you make a zillion dollars a year, you don't need to worry about, well, how do I, you know, pay for college for a third of the money or something, but maybe you don't have the money and then it becomes more important, you know? So, so I got a question here. How did you get into mobile home parks? <laughs> um, it was from running my networking group. So when I, you know, that's an interesting thing. Um, Sometimes you're, you know how you see people say that uh, corny saying where your network is your net worth or whatever that is. But, uh, you know, when I ran that networking group, people would reach out to me with investment vehicles that want to come present at the group, that type of thing. So one of them was mobile home parks. We, you know, we had all kinds of stuff. We had everything from condos on a cruise ship to cabins on islands off the coast of Alaska. We had everything, you know, so, um, but one of them was mobile home park storage centers and they would come to present at the group. And um, I liked what they were investing in. I liked the model. I liked the numbers. I liked the tax advantages of mobile home parks. Um, and I, that's where I probably first professionally started raising capital for someone. I was actually went to work for that company and was raising capital for them. So I was kind of learning how to raise capital at, at my job, you know? And, and you obviously did well. I mean, you, you, you accumulated some mobile home parks. I know you went into some of the challenges with the partnerships. Oh, book. yeah. I mean, you know, there were times throughout, you know, all of my career where things didn't work out. Um, you know, I've been in land development deals that didn't work out and things that don't work out. But, you know, I was actually telling, uh, you know, my partners this uh, not too long ago. I go, you know, we're going to approach someday, you know, if I live long enough where you're managing a billions of dollars in assets, you couldn't do that if you didn't fail along the way at something like you wouldn't have learned enough. You wouldn't have been able to get to where you are. And I really don't have any too many regrets of, uh, some of the business ventures I went into because if you didn't live it and learn it, you wouldn't be prepared to handle the opportunity that's in front of you today kind of thing. You know, it's kind of like, uh, you know, opportunities come our way, but you got to have to be ready to receive it, right? If you're not ready to receive it, the opportunity just goes by. Well, you have to be ready and you have to be experienced and you have to be, you know, knowledgeable and, and all those things or it would just, it just wouldn't work out for you, right? So I think it's, you know, it's more like fail, for, fail fast and furious and, and, you know, 
and course correct, right? It's, uh, it's not about always making the right decision. It's about making the decision right kind of thing. You know? Yeah, you mentioned that in your book. Also, um, what's interesting is, uh, you know, one of the regrets that you pointed out was that you didn't go to enough meetings, networking meetings, real estate clubs. And, and so you feel like maybe you, you missed out on some opportunity that way. So do you feel like, you know, if you could do it again and you would have gone to, you know, more meetings, meet more people, you would have, you know, received more opportunities or you would have, uh, I'd be divorced. Um, <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> no, I, uh, you're right. At one point I was going to like eight meetings a month. I mean, it was a crazy number, but you know, you kind of, it's like anything you can get addicted to it or whatever you want to call it. But I, I think today, I think the biggest thing is meetings. Some of the best meetings for me are not the meetings in the space that I'm in. It's in the meetings that it's not the space that I'm in. Like I'm actually going to a meeting tomorrow with 15 CEOs, right? Um, those CEOs are in all different lines of work. Sometimes I learn more there than I do going to, you know, maybe a note group or a real estate group. Um, nothing against the note or real estate group, but I think you, you should do kind of both a little bit. The other thing is you want to get out of your area. And that's one of the things like I like about the mid Atlantic summit is I'm bringing in a lot of people from other areas and you learn totally different strategies. The way things guys are doing things in the West coast or Dallas or Chicago are different than the East coast. A uh, classic example of that is uh, house hacking, Airbnb, things like that. They have a totally different setups out there. Um, but we have people coming from all over, uh, literally, uh, the, the part of this is 6,000 miles. Somebody's coming from the Philippines and Alaska and Spain. And you get these people with different ideas and you get them in one place, you know, whether that's New York or San Francisco area, you start to get all these new ideas going and you go home and you're like, wow, I can't wait to, <laughs> to do something different. And I think, um, you know, it's one thing to get the ideas and then you got to implement them. That's the hard part. Right. But, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, well, you know, I, I got one last question here. What are some of your daily rituals? <laughs> I'm a pretty boring guy. No, um, I do get up early. Usually, typically 5.30, 6. This is like a Tim Ferriss question, right? What do you do every morning for breakfast? I usually get up. Um, I work out. I read. A little, some of it's kind of meditative in a way. Um, I do writing in the morning a lot of times. So reading, writing, all that type of stuff. I work out. And I usually drink a shake, um, mostly veggies, not very interesting. Um, I like coffee. And then, um, and then I'm usually off to work. Um, I recently moved and I'm four minutes from the office, which is probably a good and bad thing. Um, but no, I, I, I love what I do and I, you know, I love what I'm building here and I'm passionate about what we're building and I, you know, it's exciting and we're at exciting times here and, we're experiencing a lot of growth and um, it's exciting. Great, great. Well, um, thank you very much for joining us here, Mr. Dave Van my, Horn. My pleasure. And, um, you know, we, you can go, there's still tickets left. That was another question. Is there still availability to come to the summit? There is, but there's not many. I, I know it's almost sold out. Um, yeah, it's, it, you're getting down to the wire right now. I know it's, uh, uh, it's almost sold out. So yeah, if you're going to go, I, I would jump on it. Um, there is a property tour too. They have one day and it, and it is being recorded as well. So, but yeah, I, it, we're, we're approaching around 400 people right now. So it's going to be a big event. Great. I'm going to post the link on, on my page here in the comments section, if that's okay. Awesome. Yeah. And, I appreciate it. Yeah. And, uh, and I, I'm, I'm going to look forward to seeing you in a few weeks. I know, I know a bunch of others, um, as well that are on the group are going to, you know, uh, be there in attendance as well. So I want to thank you again for joining us and my pleasure. I know it'll be worth the trip. Good. I look forward to meeting you. Oh yeah. I went to Drexel. Again. So, so I love getting back to Philly. Yeah. Now nah, it'll be a good time. We're going to have fun. Great. Well, thank you and everyone and God bless. Take care everyone.